Good morning, everyone. Uh, right, so a couple of things. First, um, you might have seen the piece on the internet this week that we've had an issue with uh, our, our waiting lists. Uh, during the pandemic, we had some patients in a part of the waiting list where they've been referred from GPs to our services. Um, where as a result of an automatic process in those waiting lists, they were being taken off after 180 days without us or the GP being notified. Now, it's a known problem with those GP referral waiting lists, um, but during the pandemic, and the use of different sections of the waiting list to manage some of the demand that's become a problem for us and it's meant that we've got a group of a couple of hundred patients who've come on to our two year plus waiting list and around 600 patients in total who've been added to our 52 week wait uh, total so we've been phoning all those patients and letters have gone out to some of the ones we haven't been able to contact to make sure that we get them booked in and they get seen and um, there were routine gp referrals into clinics and a couple of specialties and i think uh you know it's a shame it's happened it's it's a, a pity for those patients because it's a really stressful process to be on those waiting lists um, and we are going to have a look at how it's happened and, and make sure that we've checked to see if anyone's come to any harm but the really important thing when you find things like this is in the first place to be open about the fact that you've identified a problem let patients gps know which is what we've done this week and um, so we've been transparent about the fact we've got a problem which is the right way to respond to problems in the workplace in healthcare and the next thing is to make sure that we get those folk cared for and so as a result, the teams in the specialties affected, predominantly neurosurgery and um, gynaecology, ophthalmology and one or two others. What they're doing is putting on extra clinics to make sure people get the care that they need. And, you know, we can take a lot of heart from the fact that we're performing well on surgery at the minute. We've made some really good inroads into our backlog, although we're seeing more and more people coming onto the front end. So our waiting list is increasing overall because of that additional demand that's coming in through primary care. But we are doing very well in that respect and it was good to see last week's tables we get league tables for london every week and the number one slot in london last week for performance on high volume low complexity surgery it was bhrut you know so there's a couple of areas where we're performing really well and that does give me confidence actually we've got the right people across the specialties and in operations and other areas supporting them to put this right so thanks to all of you who've been involved in dealing with the fallout from that you know, um, mistakes happen in healthcare. We do get problems in healthcare. Uh, when we find them, let's be open and transparent and um, let's put them right. And our responsibility now is to fix this and get those patients the care that they need. So that was the first thing I wanted to talk about. And um, only one other thing from me um, predominantly, which is tomorrow we're having a, a non-meeting day. Um, uh, it's the first of what I hope will be many of these. Um, for some of you, you won't have a workload that's particularly meeting heavy, but I know for some of us, it is a really big part of, um, of our day to day work. And, and sometimes trying to find time to do actual work in amongst the meetings can feel like a frustratingly difficult thing to do. And so we're, we are having a no meeting today, tomorrow, which I hope will be the first of, of a regular occurrence of these. I mean, in my case, there's a couple of services and we about to spend some time with the staff and um, having a look at what's going on around there. Um, but really, there's information being put together on how you should try to make the most of this. But we, we do need to be careful sometimes that our diaries don't become everything we do and that we don't within the workplace just end up ruled by the meetings that we're invited to. Because uh, I try and keep a sort of running total in my head and the number of hours a week I spend in sessions where I come out and think I'm not sure anything's been achieved there that couldn't have been achieved in a conversation with someone um, in a better way. So we need to, Teams has made it easy for us to fill every half hour of certain people's days with meetings back to back. Uh, we need to think differently about that culture. Actually, how do we get things done in a healthcare environment? Is it through meetings or are there other better ways sometimes of making those connections? Um, we had a really good session in um, the old records centre at Queen's earlier this week to look at emergency care improvement. And I was really struck by how positive and energetic the session was because you had 50 or 60 people in a room together discussing ideas and sharing ideas. Now, technically that was a meeting, but it didn't feel like one because it felt useful and it felt like we made connections and got things done. So. Have a look at how we use tomorrow and let's think about maybe making that a much more regular feature because I, for one, feel a great lightning of my heart when I look at a day and say, actually, I feel I can get stuff done today rather than jumping from one team's session to the next. And um, next up, I'm just going to bring Catherine in um, to talk about something that's going to be happening in July before we move on to Ben to talk about the staff survey. So Catherine, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and I just wanted two minutes really to talk about um, a thank you event. Uh, for those of you who were in the organisation when we came out of special measures in 2017, uh, we organised a big thank you event over a day. Uh, we want to do a similar thank you event really for people um, over the last couple of years who've had to work extraordinarily hard during the COVID pandemic. So we're going to have a Jubilee thank you event. Uh, we've had a bit of difficulty organising this because I cannot tell you how difficult it is to secure a marquee at the moment. 
it appears to be that everybody's having a wedding or a celebration for the uh, Platinum Jubilee. So we now think that we have secured a marquee for the 22nd of July. So this is a sort of placeholder in your diary. Um, and we believe we will be able to run it on the ice rink again. Uh, the reason that we're going to run it on the ice rink is because um, it's already got Harris fencing around it and it means that we don't have to put that security fencing up. If we had it in another environment, we would have to put that fencing up and obviously there would be a cost associated with that. Uh, this will be the last time we'll be able to use the ice rink because as I'm sure you're all aware, we have now, or the, the company who owns that area has now got planning permission, so they'll be building flats. So if we run this event in future years, we'll have to do it somewhere else. The current um, group of people on the task and finish group include obviously myself, um, uh, people, uh, all the chairs of the networks, uh, unions and quite a lot of people for doing estates and facilities team because this is quite estates and facilities heavy. We also have the chaplains as well as part of that, that team. We're currently planning to have a breakfast for about 500 people at Queen's Hospital um, on the ice rink in, in the marquee that we're securing there. We would like to have lunch at KGH. Um, we think we will have a variety of uh, food vans at KGH, uh, including things like fish and chips, curries, pizza, etc. Um, and that will be held in a space behind the current vaccination centre by the old laundry, uh, because we think we can secure that, but it's a much smaller space. So we will probably be able to have 500 people there, but it might have to be in two tranches of 250. So we're just looking at that now. Afternoon tea, we'll be back at the marquee and in the, um, on the ice rink, and that will be for about 500 people, followed by a party in the evening for about 1500 people. Uh, the most exciting thing about that party is uh, Matthew is going to headline the band, uh, which is currently practicing um, every week. So they're going to be the live band and people will be able to um, uh, bid to sing alongside that, that band. Um, so I, I think that's um, something very different and very exciting. We've got a number of people from the organisation who are part of that. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that comms will be coming out about that once we have the final um, absolutely definite marquee ice rink lined up um, but we think that, that will be in place by next Wednesday so I just wanted to sort of um, give people advance warning really and I hope you can come along we can accommodate uh, just in excess of 3,000 people so that's quite a lot of our staff. Thanks thanks very much Catherine and um, I'll be on the keyboard so I'll be quite far back on the stage anyway but um, we will be looking for talented musicians to come forward uh, so thank you very much for that so there's a couple of things there then no meeting day and um, the thank you session and all this of course is part of us really focusing on how we make this a better place to work and um, because we've had our staff survey results in recently and um, they're really important and it's important that everyone in the organization takes a bit of time to look into what they're saying about the experience of working here um, and what we've seen this year's results which were based on a survey that was run um, in the, the sort of third quarter of the year so in the autumn period last year is that there's, there's some good good signs in there actually from some initiatives that were, were put in place last year particularly around things like um we've been run through my conversations and ben's going to say more about this in a minute but there's still too much in there that we 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 need to do something about in terms of people's experience of bullying and harassment at work people's experience of racism at work the experience that a number of our staff have just of not having enough resources to do a job to the standard they would like to do. And so we put um, some information out on the internet yesterday about some of our promises as a senior team to try to get to grips with this. But Ben's now going to talk us through um, some of those findings, some of the actions we're taking. And, and when you hear about things like this, you know, let's put on a staff thank you party. Let's have a no meeting day. This is all part of us trying to build a culture of the place that makes it a better place in which to work. So think about these things in the context of what Ben's now going to run you through. We all have a responsibility to pull together here to try to turn this around. And uh, what Ben's going to put now is some context on this and, and talk you through some of the commitments as a senior team that we want to make to get us into a better place. So I'm going to hand over now to Ben Morin, please. Thank you, Matthew. Um, great to see you all. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you some PowerPoint, but I'm going to move through it really quickly because it'll be lovely to get any reactions to it from any of you. And uh, we'll get these slides out and about. So if you want to refer to more detail on them, you can look at them at any point. Uh, for those of you who haven't met, uh, who joined recently, welcome to BHIUT. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer. I've been working with a range of colleagues to think about how we can think about uh, the future for everyone who works with us or we will be joining us in coming months. And the way we've thought about that is to think about having a common framework for how we bring things together exactly as Matthew has, has just referred to. 
And so with a range of you and colleagues across the organisation, we've been thinking about what's our purpose in caring for people and looking after them across the organisation. And this is where we've um, we've got to uh, with the board in recent weeks. Um, and equality, diversity and inclusion um, will be and are, I think, so important to all of this in making sure we're clear about the relative difference of people's experience working in BHIUT and how making the best of all the skills we've got, just as the, the background to Remy and Peter and, and Justin, many I can see at the moment shows, is better when we're working together, making the most of all the skills that we have here. So uh, we've been looking at the best of practice in and beyond the NHS um, and thinking about how we can apply a lot of that to um, BHIUT. And as we do that, how the pride way in the way we think about sustainable improvement uh, can guide us too. So what we hope we've got are some really exciting ideas informed by staff that build upon the National People Plan. And those of you who know the People Plan will be really clear that it's got five key elements to it. So uh, we wanted to make sure we take account of those, uh, but we wanted to make sure we were doing something that was helpful and based on the needs of colleagues here. So what we've ended up with is pretty simple framework that has six key components uh, that relate to education, uh, leadership and talent, uh, modern employment practices, which sounds a bit of a mouthful, doesn't it? Um, but it's really about recruitment, how we modernise our approach to recruitment and selection, how we think about flexible working and how we think about fairness when behaviours are below the line that any of us would expect. Um, and speed of all those processes for all of that too. It's about well-being, um, and I'm going to touch on that in a minute, and it's about how we make sure that our strategies is collaborative with partners and values and informed by the needs of partners too. So um, what does that mean for you? Uh, in language that hopefully makes sense to colleagues across the organisation is tangible, making a difference. Well, uh, this slide summarises what we think um, it means, and it refers back to the presentation and the comms that went round from Matthew yesterday in the update for everyone. And I'm just going to talk to each of these, and we'd love you to get your thoughts and reactions to them and any questions in a minute. So on leadership and talent, uh, we recently agreed to work with the King's Fund to design a brand new approach to leader development that will be up and running by the summer. And it will be an expectation all of our leaders play a part in that. Uh, and we hope through a really modernised curriculum that responds to their needs and what they're saying they want as leaders, as well as having a clear sense of the direction of travel for the organisation and our collaboration with BARTS. So that should be a really exciting programme. I think it's one of the going to be one of the most invested in programmes for any trust in London in the next year, um, and hope many of you enjoy that. And for colleagues who are working at team level, who would also like to gain from more devoted support for them as line managers, we are crediting our core elements leadership curricula with the Chartered Management Institute to upgrade it, and that process is going really well. So there will be an associated management program for team leaders who are not yet in leadership positions at the level of uh, divisional level or the, the executive too. In terms of modernising the way we employ, that means a different approach to recruitment selection that will reduce some of the core processes that are otherwise in play at the moment, as well as committing to approaches that allow us to recruit them, um, at greater speed, um, with an emphasis on inclusion and diversity in the way we make selection decisions, particularly where we know that our teams are not particularly diverse at the moment and we need to go further, faster, uh, more quickly. Um, and then making sure every post we have is open to flexible working, uh, that being the default position for everything we advertise. Now, on well-being, we've rolled out the My Conversation process last year. Many of you will know that replaced the appraisal process. We've had some really useful feedback on that process, largely really positive, suggesting a few tweaks. We're going to run that process now earlier in 22-23. So the leadership, uh, the executive are beginning that process in the next few weeks, and we'll aim for everyone to have had a My Conversation by the end of September. That will avoid us having this overhang over the winter where people are still completing that process. And we think for the health and well-being of every colleague, that's really, really important. We're also doing some work through Stacey Lane, looking at the costs of living facing all staff and what we can do as a modernised committed employer to think about that. And that there'll be tangible initiatives up and running pretty soon on that front too. The next two um, elements of this really quickly relate to leadership um, and development with our partners and communities. So we'll be rolling out some new education 
opportunities for people to have opportunities to work with us uh, in BHRUT. Um, uh, and that's really core cool to what we're doing next. Um, and we hope we can involve local partners in the way we co-design that uh, with them really quickly. The last and probably the most difficult part of this, and the sensitive part, is about how we deal with instances where people behave as managers and leaders below the line um, and how we need to address bullying and harassment. And that's going to be a really important part of how we give um, confidence to colleagues that we mean what we say about misogyny, sexism, racism and discrimination at work, and we're tackling that face, um, face on quickly and um, fairly with colleagues. And so we will be making some changes about how we address that and speak about that in the next few months with a group with unions and others. Um, there's a steady stream of, of such cases that we, we can't and shouldn't talk about, but I think show bigger in the way we're addressing that uh, week on week and month on month where we need to. But most importantly, supporting great management where it happens to in the organisation, and there's lots of that. Matthew spoke about that at the start of the meeting. So enough from me. Really happy to take any questions. Um, and listen to any reflections, but I hope that gives you a sense of what we're going to focus in on uh, in the next few weeks and how we're going to do it too. Thanks very much, Ben. I'm just looking Rose, please. Yeah, um, a couple of things. Um, hi, Ben. Hi, Matthew. Morning, or is it afternoon? No, it's still morning. Uh, right, so yes, that's good that we're addressing the bullying and harassment and discrimination within the trust because I think it's long overdue um, and I do believe that if people can see that these things are being addressed and they're being tackled and they're being wiped out then people will feel more obliged to come forward if something is happening and I just want to touch on something else that Matthew said um, the I'm really glad to hear that they're dealing with the backlog of waiting list but I'm a little bit concerned about patients who are long-term patients that are waiting for appointments and get cancelled on the day or the day before when they've already been waiting like six months and then they have no idea when the next appointment is coming up and in between that as we know if you're unwell things can change overnight and you can get worse or you can get a little bit better but those that are not getting better are kind of being held back from their treatment. Um, the other issue, last thing but not least, um, working from um, IT issues. Um, now I'm actually joining this meeting on my phone because I can't get into my laptop today. Um, and I'm being told I need to bring it into the trust. And obviously, as you well know, I can't just get up and go to the trust. I don't know what can be done about that, but those that are working from home can't always just drop things and come into the trust to have a password changed. Thanks, Rose. So, I mean, we can pick up things like about the IT issues um, separately, but certainly it's, you know, it's interesting talking about non-meeting day. There's a different context, isn't there, for people who do that in an office-based environment and those who are home-based, because it is a very different experience depending on whether you're on a site or not. So we do need to make sure that we remember our home-based colleagues as part of this, and those of us, including me, who work from home from time to time, and make sure we get that balance right. And on the cancellations, I think we're working hard to try to make sure that we have as few as possible. I know we've got the new um, resolution service in place for people who've been particularly long waiters for planned care. And actually, it was partly through that, I think, that we started to pick up the problem with these drop lists because people were calling up and we were figuring out we had some issues there. But I think generally, as part of our recovery strategy for the trust, it's about making sure that people who are missing um, the care that they're entitled to get it as quickly as possible and, and certainly across the NHS at the minute in primary and secondary care for physical and mental health. I know there's some real pressures and real backlogs and um, it's going to take the service a number of years before we really try and get on top of what the pandemic's done to us in addition to recognising the growing population health need that we're getting as people are living longer but sometimes and particularly with um, what we're seeing coming through in long COVID more, more complex requirements and care requirements so so thanks for that contribution Rosen for recognising that we really do need to get grips also with the bullying and harassment issues and then Grace please Hi, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Ben, for the information you've just shared. I just wondered, with the new King's Fund training, is that meant to replace the, I think it was Aspire Leaders that we were doing before. Is that the same as the Aspire Leaders? Is it different? What What's the connection between the two and how will that work? Thanks for your question, Grace. Um, absolutely, Aspire is will continue. So um, it will be an associated programme. So the King's Fund programme will mainly focus on colleagues in leadership positions 
um, who are divisional level or executive level or aspiring for those forms of leadership first in the summer and autumn, and then we'll roll it out. But the Aspire programmes and devoted programmes to bring on talent from communities less well represented will absolutely stay. And in fact, the investment in Aspire will increase in the next year. What we'll do in the next few weeks, and I hope it helps Grace, is create a portfolio that shows exactly what leadership and talent development will be available for colleagues in the organisation so they're clear about what's being developed and how it will fit. hope that helps. Thank you, ben. Thanks, ben. Okay, folks, so I think that's all the hands I can see at the minute. Um, Becky, I don't think there was anything else we had on the agenda th for today, was there? No, okay. there's nothing else. Right, well, on the, in the general spirit of um, non-meeting day, I'm not going to try to make meetings last any longer than they should do either as well. Um, I'm conscious that it is um, Eid this weekend as well. So uh, for those of you who are celebrating that in the coming days, I hope you have a, a very enjoyable time. And uh, thank you all for your time today. See you all later.